All right, well, we're going to uh, dive now into our message for today. If you want to be opening up your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. This is a book that you're probably, if you've been a Christ follower for a little while, a little familiar with. I was talking to some people before the service, and when I mentioned Philippians, out came a verse right away, Philippians 4, 13. You've probably heard of it too. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's a beautiful verse, and uh, we're going to be in that same book, just back a chapter or two. Let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Ah, dear Holy Spirit, we need you right now. We need you to come into our hearts and, and open the eyes of our heart. What a beautiful day, Father, you've created outside for us, the, the light shining and the crisp air. Create spiritually that same effect in here. Shine your light into our hearts. Uh, make our hearts uh, awake and alive through this message of humility that we're about to hear that comes directly from you. Lord, we do want to be excellent for your sake, and that means spiritually and morally excellent because we want to serve and glorify you. And all these virtues, Lord, they don't come from within us. They come from within you down to us. Shower us with humility. Help us to repent of our pride, Lord, and grant us that today we grow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So i got to start with a little account of familiarizing myself with Chicago. You know, I've been here a couple months uh, now, and I'm starting to spread my wings with Julie. I should say we are starting to spread our wings. And we knew that within our church family, there is a perfect tour guide for learning about Chicago. And also, uh, last month was Pastor Appreciation Month, so one day I walked into my office and there was this beautiful basket that said, thank you, Pastor, for being our pastor. I was a little sad uh, Pastor Dustin didn't get one, only I did. Um, Oh, wait a minute, you did get one, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, he did, he got one. And inside this basket uh, was a card to Lou Malnati's. And he got a Lou Malnati's card, we got a Lou Malnati's card, so I'm like, where is Lou Malnati's? And Pastor Dustin, he knew exactly where it was. So, on Friday night, we did uh, a tour-guided tour of downtown Chicago, and of course, I've got some photos for you. You can't tour downtown Chicago without seeing the Bean, so we went to the Bean in the afternoon. It was a beautiful day, too. Then uh, we uh, were also, after dinner, we strolled along the riverfront. It was gorgeous. You can see just fantastic, and uh, uh, the Bloomers are acting happy to be with us. That was nice of them. Um, (laughs) And yeah, look at that. So even Pastor Dustin's smiling, you know. He doesn't smile at me like that every day, but it was good. Okay, we can go to the next one. We had a fabulous dinner, right? And uh, yeah, I think the waiter was targeting us there. I'm not sure what was going on. But we, we had a great thank you to those who gave us the Lou Malnati's card. It was fantastic. All right, next one. And we went to, this was the highlight. Dustin said, we have to go to the Art Institute. We have to see the Monet exhibit. So we did. We went and we saw the Monet exhibit. It was, we saw Van Gogh's, Toulouse-Lautrec. I mean, I learned all, more about art than I learned in my college art class, I think, on this tour. It was great. As we were leaving to head to the restaurant, go back yet, I want, I want everybody to notice the messages. Did you notice that? Bad is good, up is down, happy is sad, right is wrong, truth is fiction, anything goes. Now what struck me about that was that that we didn't hit that until we were leaving, as I just mentioned. And a few minutes before that, we had been before this statue, uh, a statue of one of my my heroes, and, um, and there he is. Um, Marcus Aurelius. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Marcus Aurelius, but Marcus Aurelius was uh, an emperor of Rome. 
He's known as the last of the five good emperors. After that, things really began to fall apart in the Roman Empire. And Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. Stoic philosophers, I mentioned in in my introduction to the service that um, the idea of virtue was amongst the Romans actually an idea of manliness. Virtus is how to be a man, how to be a proper man, a courageous man. And so that whole idea amongst Marcus Aurelius and his peers was the idea of I want to build strong, good men, obviously because they were world conquerors and and such, but just to be a good Roman citizen. So here's a statue made of stone that anyone who knows anything about Marcus Aurelius would be saying is, an ancient and lasting reminder of virtue. And we walk almost literally from this statue to the hallway that takes you out, and there are those banners. And when we think about the things that have been going on in the, in the past several years and how it may to us as believers in Christ feel like virtue has been eroding, I think that's where the idea for this series came from. The idea that Christ brought the real meaning of virtue, even more so than any Stoic philosophy. And more more importantly, a lot of the virtues do overlap. The Stoics thought of humility as a strong virtue too, but what's behind that? What's the why of being virtuous? What's the why of being a humble person? Obviously, we as Christ followers have our own special twist on that because we are, as we just read, worshiping the Son of God, the true Son of God. So with that little introduction about virtue and humility, I want to take us to an account from Philippians 2, and I want to read with you these verses. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the congregation, you have to know this, a little bit of background, the Philippians were his strongest supporters. This town itself was a Roman garrison town. It was a place where there were a lot of Romans gathered. Uh, One of the places where maybe in in the entire empire you had a great concentration of Romans who had been taught to be virtuous from a civic point of view, a a Roman citizen's point of view. And now Paul's going to come in and he's going to say, let me tell you the real reasons for the virtues that we as followers of Jesus Christ want to shine out into the world because the world needs us. Do you realize that? Why Christians can't hide in a corner as much as we might like to Why Christians can't be too overly shy that we don't shine the light of Jesus Christ and his glory and his virtue out into the world is our world will not stay going strong without these things. They need you. They need me. They need us especially together. And that's one of the messages to the Philippians. He's encouraging the Philippians to stick together to shine the glory of these virtues, to shine the light of Christ out into the world. So with that, let's read. Uh, if If you have your Bible app, feel free to follow along. It'll be up on the screen as well. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. Now, look, look at those words while they're still there, and ask yourself, what is Paul laying out there as the motive for what he's about to say? What's, how is he motivating them? Are you united with Christ? That would be a great motive for what's about to follow. Do you find comfort from his love? Let that draw you out into the world with what's about to follow. If any common sharing in the Spirit, we just prayed (laughs) that the Spirit would come into us and that we would share Him in common. If, If you have any tenderness and compassion for others. And then we start with this word. Then, make my joy complete by being like minded 
having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. This is a letter, in other words, that's pointed to us as church, not to us as individuals. It's saying, church, amazing love. Let these be your goals. One-mindedness, one-spiritedness, having the same love. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And another way of wording this for our world today, not looking to your own rights, but to the rights of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, there it is again, we saw it earlier in John 13, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The, the Greek word there is actually like grabbed hold of and I will not let go of it. That would be like Jesus saying, no, I'm God, I'm God, I'm the Son of God. I will never let go or appear as if I'm not the Son of God. Paul's going to tell us he totally opened up his hand and divested himself as a human being of showing the glory of being the Son of God. He always was the Son of God, but he didn't always use his powers as the Son of God. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is why Peter struggled with letting Jesus wash his feet. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All right. Pull out your, your, uh, your notes and... I want you to pay attention just right away. I'm going to dive right into this topic of humility. And what, what is humility? And I, I have a statement I want you to take home that I hope you will use in your daily life. And it's this simple phrase, it's not all about me. It's not all about me. It, I think that if we could develop that as a little bit of a mantra for life, it's not all about me, and then I'm going to add something to it, we're better together. And we truly are. I don't have all the strengths and gifts. What a, what a privilege it is even just to have another pastor, not to mention all the devoted and dedicated members of this church the leadership team, the volunteers, all of you, do you know that even on a Sunday morning, there is a completely different vibe for our guests when we all come together and fill this room than there is when there's only a few people in here? If you don't believe me, stay for the 11 o'clock. <laughs> and we love the 11 o'clock service. I'm not cutting them down. But it's a different vibe. We love our 11 o'clock people. And we want to fill that room. And I'm asking for your help to fill that room. And if there's something we need to change, we're talking even right now about, you know, do we need to shift the times a little bit to fill up that room at 11 o'clock? And thanks to you guys, we're doing a pretty good job of filling up the room at 930. Thank you. Because we're better together. I, I, would, I think I can guess that the, the band and the vocalists love their rehearsal time, but they really love when you're all in here singing together with them. So it, it's not all about me. We're better together. Take a look at Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Remember, motivated by what we pointed out earlier, that we're loved by Christ, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's interesting because that, that word value, do you see it in the middle there, uh, verse 3? It, it really means to assess. When your taxes come along every year, you probably get a little letter from the government that says your home was assessed as having a value as X. This is encouraging all of us not to assess ourselves as nothing, but to assess ourselves correctly. That's what the word really means. It doesn't mean, as many people think humility means, is to value yourself less or to assess yourself as a big fat zero. And, and in fact, many people go through life doing that, and it does nothing to help them have the virtue of humility. In fact, psychologists will tell you what that is, is false humility. And one of the most famous and well-known definitions of what humility really is, is the definition you've probably already heard. It's almost become cliche, but it's important because it's true. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Can you help me finish? but it is thinking of yourself less, less frequently. Think about how hard that is to do. When we're in pain, I'll, I'll put it to me. When I'm in pain, who do you think I think about? Me and my pain. When I'm successful, what's my temptation? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's because I'm pretty smart, pretty strong. I love me. And I assess my value as being pretty high in that point, at that point, right? Instead of, instead of saying, I, 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 how difficult is it for us to just shift our language the way Paul is encouraging us to do, looking to our own interests, not looking to our own interests, but to the interests of others, and say, we. I know Pastor Dustin thinks this way because he gives me all my favorite passages, this being amongst them. I get to teach on passages from the book. You know what the whole book of Philippians is about? It's about joy. If you want to find joy... Paul is writing to the Philippians, and these are people that are extreme supporters, but there's something going on in Philippians, in Philippi. In chapter 4, we learn that between two of the leaders, there's a conflict going on. Is it that, or is it something else? We don't know exactly, but Paul keeps coming back to this theme of joy. He mentions that word joy 16 times in four chapters. That's four per chapter for those of you who are mathematical geniuses like me. Joy, 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 joy. There's only one thing he mentions more than joy. Jesus. So what's the message of the, of the book of Philippians when you boil it down even just by the mentions is we find our joy in Jesus. Keep coming back to Jesus. Keep coming back to his forgiveness, his love, his mercy, his joy in serving. You also will find joy. Look to him and that will help you assess your own value much better. How can we value ourselves as zero when we call ourselves rightfully so, dearly loved, children of God, bought, there's the value, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know how valuable you are? And yet, assess correctly means we also see ourselves through the lens of saint, through the grace of Jesus Christ, but also sinner. We have old Adams that we are constantly battling against that continue to cling to us and while i am a dearly loved son of god a, a prince really and you are princes and princesses because we are children of the most high god 
At the same time, we are also people in, in deep need of spiritual cleansing. You, you can't be mine unless I wash you, Jesus told Peter. And we're all in need of that washing from our sins. So when we assess others and our value against them, yes, we think of ourselves quite rightfully so as the children of God and, there's my favorite word, and we think of ourselves as sinners in need of God's grace, just like the person we may be tempted to devalue who's next to us. We're both at the same time, saint and sinner. So it's not all about me. We're better together. That's point number one. And the true definition of humility is not to think of yourself, uh, not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less frequently. The second point I want to make, let's read the passage, Philippians 2, verses 5 and 6. This is Paul going on, and I shouldn't say the point I want to make. This is really the point Paul is making to the Philippians. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his, own, to his own advantage. So what was Jesus' mindset? It was a both and mindset. I'm the son of God, that's who I am. Nothing's going to take that away from me, and I don't have to hold on to that as if that's the source of all joy in my life. That was not the source of all joy in Jesus' life, to walk around with his chest out and say, hey, do you realize I'm, <laughs> I'm the Son of God? You know that, right? That's not what he did. He had a different focus than himself and, and his title and who he thought he was and who he wanted others to recognize him as and for. Humility is the result, in other words, of something that's in your control with the help of God. Humility is in your control because Paul says it depends on how you set your mind. What is the, if you want to call it, the foundation, the foundational truths and beliefs upon which you establish your thinking? You set your mind. Where does that come from? Paul's saying, To start with, don't forget that Jesus loves you, that you're his child. He's also saying, be humble and recognize that at the same time you're a sinner. And do what what Jesus did. Be willing to be recognized for other things than all your good things. Do, do Do you ever notice how much of a struggle it can be sometimes to not tout yourself and your skills and your abilities and your wisdom and to hold back from saying, I did this, I thought this, this is the solution I came up with. And and some of you have been taught to market yourself in the business world. Like if I don't say what I've done and accomplished, who's going to say it? I have to carefully tend to my reputation because it won't get done if I don't tend to that reputation. Well, Paul is kind of saying something different. And here's what I want you to write down. Humility means I do not set my mind on equality. And I'll come back to that in a minute by what I mean by that. Even when it's deserved but set my mind instead on service and purpose. That's what Jesus did. He took everything in his life that he wanted to accomplish, and he said, this is is not about me being held up, not in this life as the Son of God. That'll come later in eternity. Right now, This is about me serving others and serving the purpose God sent me here for. That's how Jesus did it, and that's how he wants us to do it. 
I don't set my mind on equality. What did I mean by that? Well, what's equal to what I think I deserve? Or what's equal to how others are being treated? When you start wrapping your life around equality, whether it's equality to what you think you deserve, equality to what others are getting, equality to what you think your personal goals are, you will almost always be disappointed. Jesus didn't, he, Paul says, he gave all that up. He deserved to be called and known as the Son of God because he is and was the Son of God. But Paul says he didn't grab hold of that and think, well, look, my reputation has to be equal to who I am and what I deserve. Instead, instead he did this beautiful thing and he just let it go. Let it go. And he said, I'm going to focus on the serving I need to do and the purpose God sent me here for. And that's how he got to be where he was. Do you know how hard, how excruciatingly difficult it is to do this? One of the reasons why it's so difficult to do this is we don't even recognize when our lack of humility (laughs) is affecting us and the thoughts we have in our head. When I first came back from Africa to teach at Arizona Lutheran Academy, I, I came into a, a, a classroom, a high school classroom, high school teacher for the very first time ever. Um, I had even struggled with uh, teaching uh, middle schoolers uh, for a while when I was a vicar. Like, I was a little bit scared of the middle schoolers. Thank, thank goodness, five years of high school, I love high schoolers and middle schoolers now. But that was not now, that was then. And I came in and I, I just, I wanted to do my best. I wanted to really have these, these high schoolers come into my classroom every day and be excited about learning the Bible. And I wanted to give them helpful, valuable things. Like I was on fire to be the best high school teacher they've ever had. And so, do you know what I did? I pressed and pressed. I worked hard. I put in long hours. I didn't leave school. I made sure their homework was back to them each and every day. I tried to make it interesting. I brought other things in, and I pushed and pushed and pushed until, you know what happened? Sleeplessness worry over trying to be this great, great high school teacher, I crashed into a wall. That was part of the source of my depression, clinical depression that I went through that I've told you guys about already. And when you ask me, well, what, what, what were the elements of that? One of them was, as I had to have pointed out to me by a counselor, a good Christian counselor, was my own lack of humility and pride because he started asking me questions like this. Well, um, do you really think that you should be teaching at the level of a 25-year experienced high school teacher in 25 days? Is that what you think? Is that that how good you think you are? That what took 25 years for someone else to get to should take you 25 days to get to? That's just pride. Ridiculous pride. You're trying to shortcut. You need to learn and get experience. And I had to have that pointed out to me because, do you know what I called it in my own head? I didn't call it pride. I called it dedication. I'm devoted to these kids. I'm devoted to this job. I'm dedicated and I'm going to work and work and work. And he said, no, dude. Take a pro athlete. These are the best in the world. Do they have peak performance every day? Far from it. Pick out your favorite quarterback, Justin Fields, young guy. Is he having his best performance every game? Aaron Rodgers, I'll say that for some of you. 
Even he doesn't have his best game every game. He's not on every day. So, my counselor said, who do you think you are that you're going to walk into a classroom every day and perform at a peak? That's pride. That's a lack of humility. It's not dedication. So be careful, in other words. Because what's clearly pride and a lack of humility, our minds have this beautiful way of giving it a much better label than that. And be able, have people in your life that you trust and know and know you to be able to step back and say, what about this? Is it really dedication and devotion? I, I could, you know, moms, you could stay after and come up front. We'll just talk about, because you are dedicated and devoted. I, I was, I'm not saying I wasn't dedicated, but that idea that gets to the point of dedication to the lack of noticing that you're human and you need some recovery time once in a while and that you need me time so that you can go back out there and serve and, and, and be a true help to those kids. And not just moms, you dads who are pushing yourself to the, to the limit, to the wall, to make sure your family is well taken care of. And we honor the part of that that is devotion and dedication, and we caution against the part of it that might be a lack of humility and pride. All right, let's finish up. Last point, Jesus humbly trusted his Father for the results. Listen to how Paul puts that. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. There he is. (laughs) There's Paul saying, it's all about Jesus. And if you want humility, it's thinking less about yourself because you're thinking more about Jesus and what he did, more about others who are your fellow Christ followers, more about the others who aren't yet your fellow Christ followers but need to be because they're sinners on the road to hell. Thinking about that and then coming back to (laughs) there's nothing and no one like Jesus. And, and, and Paul mentions him here not only as an example. I want you to know that. When he talks about Jesus here in Philippians 2, our minds tend to go, oh yeah, Jesus is a great example of humility and sacrifice. I mean, being crucified. And for sure, he's a wonderful and beautiful example. But here's what's more important. For all those times when you, like me, have lacked humility or mislabeled your dedication as humility or have done other things that it basically are saying it's all about me many times without even realizing you're saying it's all about me in your words your actions for all those times in other words when the sin of pride has grabbed hold of your heart and imprisoned it and enslaved it Jesus is not only your example, which is just going to make you feel kicked in the butt over and over again because you're not going to live up to that example. He's the perfect and holy son of God. He's your substitute. Can I say that again? Because it's so important. When Paul says, remember Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Who did he do that for? Himself? No, he did that for you as your substitute to say all the times, Father, when they have been filled with pride, all the times when they have completely lacked humility, when they have lied to themselves about what was really going on in their hearts, put that on me. I'll carry it for them. And for all the needs, all the holes that they left spiritually in their lives for true humility and true virtue, 
let my virtue fill those holes. Amen. So that, Father, when you look at them, you see nothing, not only but a child of yours, but a perfect and holy child of yours. Isn't it amazing that Jesus does that for you? That when, when you walk out of hearing a message like this, you walk out truly at peace, truly with courage, because you have a father who sent you a son, and that son took all the things that you lack and did them for you, and then said, here they are. You have a savior who knows that you deserve the punishment for your sins, but says, no, divert it over here, Father. Bring it my way, and I'll carry it for them. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Do you see why Paul in this book mentions joy 16 times and Jesus 18? If you want to have joy, it's right there in your substitute, Jesus Christ. Humility, here's your last fill-in, means I follow Jesus and then I trust him for the results. And do you know that the eternal results are already locked up for you? So whatever results you're getting in this life, whatever results that may be disappointing you right now, Whatever results may be driving you to the wall, whatever results may, take, may be taking you to a dark place, step back, look at Jesus, and say, his results are the only results I truly need because those are the ones that are going to stay with me for an eternity bought by Jesus in heaven. Here's what I ask you to do for your next step today. Remember, it's not about me. We're better together. I have a very practical little thing. On Thursday, I sent an email, and in that email is an opportunity uh, to do something that Dustin has been calling for and wanted to have and we got excited about that, and that is to once again have a church directory. This is not like any church directory you've seen before. It's not a book. It's on your phone or on your computer. It's in Church Center app. So download the Church Center app and then sign up for the directory. Since we sent out that email on Thursday, um, we have gotten 61 people to join the directory. It's pretty exciting. So thanks to you who are early adopters. Um, we have about 350 people who are members and regular attenders that we'd like to have in the directory. So we've still got some ways to go. So if you would, if you would please, remember this. Humility is remembering. It's not all about me. We're better together. And one really practical, wonderful way of coming together as a church family would be to be in that directory and on that app. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you sent your son to be in our place, our true virtue, to show us humility, not only as a wonderful example of humility, but also to give us his humility that we couldn't accomplish because of our sinful pride. We are so grateful to have a Savior, Lord. And Lord, as a result of the joy and the love that we get from Jesus, now change our hearts and minds. Help us to become and to put on display the humility that only you can give and only you can grant. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.